We left off at Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 16. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 16. Uh, the Bible reads, For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. So the author is saying that there were some Jews. Remember, the story is the Jews wandering in the wilderness with Moses. Some of them, when they heard God speaking to them, God's call to them, they kept provoking the Lord. They kept making him upset. And the author continues that not everybody uh, came out of Egypt successfully through the wilderness as Moses led them. So that's what the King James Bible said, which is very true. Not everybody came out of Egypt successfully uh, through Moses' leadership. There were only two who survived. That was Joshua and Caleb, and that is the younger generation. So if you know that story, then you do know that those are the ones who survived through the wilderness wanderings as they came out of Egypt by Moses. However, if you look at your modern Bible translations, this is one of the top verses that you want to mark down on what's wrong with modern Bible translations. The New King James Bible also made this mistake. So believe it or not, how they read is that they say everybody who came out of Egypt died in the wilderness. Now that's obviously not true, all right? Because remember Joshua, Caleb, and the children survived, right? But then the modern Bible translations, they said that everybody who came out of Egypt died in the wilderness. So that's what those modern Bible translations read. New King James versions, it says, For who having heard rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? But no, that's not true. Everybody who came out of Egypt did not rebel against the Lord. Joshua and Caleb and then the children, gener the younger generation were the exception. But the New King James Bible, you heard that? It's saying that everybody who came out of Egypt led by Moses rebelled against God and they were the ones who died in the wilderness. That is obviously not true. Here's the NIV. The NIV reads right here, Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? Uh, no. <laughs> That's like a, a dumb question. Were they not all those led out of Egypt by Moses? No. <laughs> Isn't that funny? They expected us to answer yes. <laughs> Here's the other one from the NESB, New American Standard. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? No. <laughs> Here's the ESV, you know, the one they've been raving about. You know, that's the English that sounds very uh, authoritative English, but follows the best manuscripts. All right, let's see what they have to say. They, uh, it reads right here, For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? No. <laughs> they expect us to say yes. Uh, this is the error in the modern Bible translations that you want to mark down, all right? So that is one of those errors in the modern Bible translations is Hebrews chapter 3, verse 16. The King James Bible reads correctly. It says, for some, when they had heard, did provoke. See, not everybody. Some upset the Lord. They were the ones who rebelled. How be it not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, meaning that not everybody who came out of Egypt survived. That's what it means. <laughs> But the modern Bible translations go, wasn't it everyone that, uh, that came out of Egypt by Moses that rebelled? No, it, they, not all of them. King James Bible says some. What did they do with some? Wasn't the, I guess they didn't find that in their Greek, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> so then their Greek manuscript is probably faulty. Or the translators are the ones that are faulty. Yeah. Woo, yeah. come on. So this is not being nitpicky right here. Either your Greek manuscript is at fault, it has an error, and the manuscripts behind the King James Bible are superior, or the translators were the ones at fault. They don't want to admit both of them. Maybe it is both of them, actually. Not either or. Maybe it is both of them. 
All right, let's look at verse 17. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? Meaning, who were the ones that God was grieved with during the 40 years of wandering? Wasn't it those who sinned? See, it's not everybody who came out of Egypt. It's the ones who sinned, whose carcasses, meaning that they died out in the wilderness, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness. Verse 18, And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. Meaning, so to, to whom did God swear that those people would never enter into his rest, which is, again, referring to the promised land, right? So, you will not, I swear that you will not enter into the promised land. That's what the rest is referring to. Who are the ones? Those that didn't believe. Those who are the unbelievers. So the Jews did not believe in God's promise in conquering the land of Canaan. They didn't have enough faith. They were scared of the giants, the walls. So because they didn't believe, that's why the Lord got upset with them. And he swore that you're not going to enter into the promised land. Verse 19, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Uh, simple, it's self-explanatory. Self -explanatory. The author is saying, hence we can see from all this that these Jews could not enter inside the promised land because of unbelief. They had no faith. All right, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Meaning, the author is saying, so we should also be afraid from this lesson of those Jews who could not enter into God's rest due to their unbelief. So this promise that is left for us as well to enter inside God's rest, we could fall short of it. As we're trying to enter in there, as we're trying to strive to get in there, we can fall, sh we can not all the way, close but not close enough, fall short of it, and then we fall out. So this shows a falling off of God's rest. Verse 2, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. So we were preached, uh, the gospel was preached to us, including to those Jews. So those Jews heard the gospel. Now I'll explain that a little bit more later, so just remember that, all right? But the word preached did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Meaning that the word of God that was uh, preached to them, it didn't benefit them. It didn't profit them. They didn't put it to good use because it was not mixed with faith. So that word that was preached to them, as they received it, it did not, their faith did not accompany it. It was not mixed with their faith. When they heard the gospel preached to them. Now, there's a lot of uh, Baptist churches, people who do not believe in dispensational salvations or the double application of the Hebrew, uh, of the general epistles, including the book of Hebrews. Yeah. In other words, what they think is they assume that Hebrews 4.2, because when you read it, it does sound like it, to be honest. What a person wrongly assumes is that because we heard the gospel, now in our minds we're thinking about Christ's death, burial, resurrection, right? Salvation by faith. That those Jews in the wilderness heard it too. But the problem with that is obviously the Jews never heard that. <laughs> yeah. They had no idea about that. I mean, if you go to the book of Numbers, that, uh, Moses never said Jesus died, buried, and resurrected. <laughs> so then... The, uh, this passage is used by people who do not believe in dispensational salvations and they think that Old Testament salvation is the same as our salvation. Now, the simple answer is this, okay? We got to find out, okay, unto us was the gospel preached. Remember, who is the us in this passage? It's not Christians in the church age. Remember the context of the book of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 2, 
is what? Last days, tribulation. And who's the title of the book addressing to? Hebrews, not Christians. Look at, look at the title of your book, all right, if you don't believe me. Does it say Christians or Hebrews? <laughs> Hebrews. So these are Jews. So Paul is speaking to Jews in the tribulation, and he's saying we've got to learn a lesson that our previous ancestors, the Jews, what they heard. But what confused us is faith and gospel at verse 2, right? That's what confused us. Now, the simple answer is this, is that if we really under looked up every time the Bible talks about faith yeah. and gospel, then we wouldn't be confused. Right. Uh, we have a biased assumption. When the Bible says gospel, we assume Christ, death, burial, resurrection. Yeah. That's a biased assumption. To us Christians, that's what our gospel is. But when you look up throughout the Bible, that's not the case. For example, do you know what the word gospel means? Notice right here, it simply means good news. It's not Paul's Christian gospel, all right? It's not Christ's death, burial, resurrection. Gospel simply means good news. That's all it means. So think about this. Weren't there many times in the Bible people gave good news to people? Of course, there's a lot of glad, like glad tidings, for example, or good news. You'll see a lot of that in your Bible. So gospel does not mean Christ's death, burial, resurrection. Okay, why is it that to Christians, our gospel is Christ's death, burial, resurrection? Because our good news is that Christ died for our sins. Amen. That's good news to us. But think about this. To the Hebrews, their good news is different. Their good news is different. Another example, and here's the easiest example, why, there are four different Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're not the same. What does that mean? The good news from John, good news from Matthew, good news from Luke, good news, etc. See, so we have to understand Gospel simply means good news. So it can mean anything. It can mean anything. Anybody could use a Gospel. Now, even Paul warned about if there's somebody giving you gos a gospel different from mine, even Paul mentioned that in Galatians, let him be accursed. What does that mean? That means that, see, there's other good news out there, that their gospel is not the same as Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Yeah. See, so even by Galatians chapter 1 from that example, it proves that gospel does not mean Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. It just simply means good news. Now, when we look at uh, Paul's gospel, he mentioned that for Christians in the church age. But this one is for a different time period, tribulation. This is for Jews. So it does not, so there won't be any contradiction with Paul's Christian gospel because his is during church age. This good news, whatever the author is saying in the book of Hebrews, is at a different time period so they don't conflate. The time period is tribulation. So if it's during the timeline of the tribulation, what is the good news to them? Well, it's very simple. If we look at verse 2, all right, it says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. So we got to look back at those Jews wandering in the wilderness. What was good news to them that they didn't believe? Now, see, your common sense is already kicking in. You can already guess. You don't really need for me to tell you. What was it, what was the good news that those Jews heard that they did not believe? And you could recall, it's, hey, the promised land. This is what God promised. We're going to conquer it. We're going uh, to enter it. We're going to defeat those enemies. God promised to give it to us. Did those Jews believe in that? They didn't believe in that. That's why God got upset and kicked them out of his promised land, rest. See, that was the good news that they did not believe. So there was no faith in there. So let's look at the book of Numbers, if you don't believe me. Look at the book of Numbers 14. Let's look at Numbers chapter 14. 
Let's go scripture with scripture, and then the Bible will give its answers. Numbers chapter 14. Now, notice what God said. Remember, the author of Hebrews said God was angry. He was provoked, right? So let's see what God was specifically provoked about in the book of Hebrews. Numbers 14 will answer it for you. Look at Numbers chapter 14, verse 11. Verse 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? Right? Mm -hmm. So what was it they provoked him on? And how long will it be ere they believe me? Ah, so that's where they had no faith. What was it? Moses, I'm upset they didn't believe in my son's death, burial, and resurrection. You think that's what he said? No. For all the signs which I have showed among them, his divine miracles, his divine hand throughout that whole wilderness. So they doubted his power during that wilderness journey and to conquer the promised land. They doubted his power. Let's uh, keep reading onward. If we look at verse 21, 21. But as truly as I live, oh, so the Lord's swearing now. Remember Hebrews said he swore in his wrath? Yeah. So this is showing it. All the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. See, it's to enter into his rest, the promised land. Good. So think about this. That's what the Lord was specifically upset about. But he, he says right here in verse 24, But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. Okay, so Caleb believed. What Caleb believed got him into God's rest, but what those Jews in the wilderness didn't believe, they weren't able to enter into his rest. So let's see what Caleb believed, okay? Let's go backwards, all right? Let's go backwards. Look at uh, Numbers 14, verse 6. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, Now look at this. Does this sound like good news? The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. Yes. See that? That's positive. That's good news. Yes. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Yes. See that? That's good news. That's the gospel then. Amen. But look what Caleb warned. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. Ah, so if they doubt this good news, if they don't believe this good news, they choose to rebel against it. Neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Look at that. Caleb is giving good news. Their defense, the enemy's defense is gone. But our defense in God is with us. So don't be afraid of them. So that's the good news. The good news is armed warfare here armed warfare, that they will succeed. That's the good news. They will conquer their enemies to be able to enter the promised land. So then, let's go backwards again. Let's go backwards. Let's go backwards. Go to chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 30. Chapter 13, verse 30. The Bible points out, and Caleb still the people. No. Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. That's good news. See that? Yes, yes. He's stilling their negative news, their bad news. The problem with these people is they believed in the bad news, not in the good news. That's why the author of Hebrews is saying they heard the gospel, meaning good news but they, cho they chose not to believe in good news. They wanted bad news. So keep reading right here. Verse 31, But the men that went up with him said, 
we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an what? Evil report. Bad news. Mm -hmm. That's good, Pastor. Okay, there is no doubt what the author of Hebrews is talking about. Not Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. It's pretty plain. It is the good news of what? Notice right here, armed warfare. The good news that the author of Hebrews is referring to is armed warfare, not Paul's Christian gospel. There is no trace, okay? Look, look, find it. Uh, just try to find it with a magnifying glass. You won't find it with a microscope, all right? I dare you, all right? You won't find anything about Christ's death, burial, resurrection in Numbers 13, 14. Numbers 13, 14 match to a T with the, what the author of Hebrews is saying. And that good news was armed warfare. It had nothing to do with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Amen. Now, think about this. The author of Hebrews was writing to Jews in the tribulation, right? So he's telling them we need to believe in this gospel, in this good news about armed warfare, so that we can enter into what's the rest, the promised land, right? That's the nation of Israel. Is it true that the Jews, during the tribulation, they need to hear this good news of armed warfare. Absolutely. Zechariah 12. Notice the language of Zechariah 12 matching with Caleb at Numbers 14. Zechariah 12. So notice that Zechariah is talking about in the last days, the tribulation, how the whole world is going up against the nation of Israel and that the nation of Israel will go up against United Nations and they need to believe in this good news of armed warfare so that they can conquer their enemies, so that they can maintain what? The promised land, God's rest, the land of Israel. Zechariah 12, 1. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day, see that? So this is sometime in the future. Will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people? All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Look at that. God said that those Jews uh, will be able to conquer their enemies and those other nations, they will be cut to pieces. They won't win. Verse 4, In that day saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness, and I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, look at this, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts their God. Isn't that similar with Caleb's statement at Numbers 14? That the Lord will be our strength. He is with us and we will conquer our enemies. See, that's good news. Verse 6, in that day will I make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood and like a torch of fire in a sheaf, and they shall devour all the people round about. On the right hand and on the left, and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. Notice right here that God says he will give strength to those Jews, and those Jews will be able to conquer their enemies. That matches to a T with Numbers 14, what Caleb's good news stated. So notice Zechariah 12 is good news. Amen. It's good news to those Jews in the tribulation. I mean, think about it. I mean, wouldn't that be good news to you if your nation is about to be conquered by all the world? Yeah. Wouldn't you like to hear that you're going to win? Yeah. That God will protect you? That's a lot of good news. That's gospel, see? It matches perfectly well. Okay, let's go back. So that's what the faith was. That's what the believing was. Now, here's another thing. If there are Christians who will insist that Hebrews 4.2 is referring to the same Christian gospel by faith without works, there is a problem. The problem is as follows. Notice uh, you want to mark these verses down if you want to prove it. Verse 1, notice that you can lose it. You fall short of it, right? Mm -hmm. Verse 1, Hebrews 4.1, you can come short of it. So meaning you can fall out of it. That ain't salvation by faith, once saved, always saved. That means you can lose it. Here's another one. 
Another one is the context, verse 14. Verse 14, you got to hold fast, remember, to the end? Hebrews 3.14, uh, 3, Hebrews 3.14. So it's 3.14, Hebrews 3.14. Notice right there, you have to endure to the end. Endure to the end, right? So uh, that don't sound like salvation by faith, enduring to the end. <laughs> That's a lot of work there. Now, you want evidence? This verse 11 is very plain. Chapter 4, verse 11. Chapter 4, verse 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Oh, you got to labor. That's a lot of work. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. See, you can fall out of salvation. This is not the same Christian gospel by faith without works. There's no doubt. Okay, it's clearly contradictory. This is a Hebrew gospel for the tribulation. Why? Because the, it makes a lot of sense that those Jews in the tribulation, they can't succumb to fear and join the Antichrist United Nations. If they do that, they're going to lose their salvation. They have to believe in their God that their Messiah will come down to save them and that they will have the strength to beat the Antichrist and the United Nations. Amen. That's a lot of faith and they're going to be afraid, but that's good news to them. All right, this makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? Yes. Right. If you put this as Paul's gospel, nothing here makes sense. Nothing here makes sense. All right. Amen. Let's look at verse 3 now, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3. For we which have believed do enter into his rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. Okay, so the author of Hebrews is saying, so us who believed in the good news will do enter into God's rest. So if he's speaking to the Jews, they're going to enter into uh, God's rest, which is, remember, this is important, his home, right? Um, now, we, I better get over here. Okay, now follow along. This is where we're going to get deep, all right? This looks deep, right? <laughs> so this looks deep, so follow along. Do you remember what we talked about, the context of chapter 3? All right, the context of chapter 3 is Christ's house being superior to Moses' house, right? Then the author of Hebrews is saying that people can fall short of entering into God's house, right? But he switched that word house into rest. Okay, so what's important to understand right here is that his house is referring to, remember, the household. We saw that one before, right? So that's referring to God's people, but it's also referring to a place. But this place, notice, is heaven or Israel. So the author, he's just simply generalizing. He's just generalizing God's rest, God's home, which can be heaven or it could be the nation of Israel itself because that's where God's home is. So it's important to understand when the author of Hebrews is saying we fall short of his rest, he's just simply talking about God's home. See that? God's home, God's place. So what is God's home, God's place? It is heaven, but also the nation of Israel when he comes down and rules this earth for a thousand years. That's why it's important to understand so far the context. The author of Hebrews, he's just simply generalizing all of that, like it's a given. But for us, we need to specify it so that we can understand really what's going on. Because in the Christian mind, they're simply thinking a Christian gospel, Christian doctrine, and going to heaven. So we don't want to mingle that uh, with the Hebrews doctrine. So the Hebrews doctrine, what they're thinking is simply what God's home is. It could be his home above, or which is the nation of Israel. It could be either or. It could also refer to his people, his household, which is obviously the Jews. Those are God's people. All right. So this is what the author is talking about, the believer in Christ's house. That's the whole point of the rest. All right. Now, this is known as rest number four, which we're going to come down to. So this is the whole point of the author. But what we're going to find out is right here, which we discussed before rest number one, is the promised land. And that's the gospel of armed warfare. 
Now, to be honest, you can combine these two together because the author is just talking about that rest, correct? So we see that. However, we divided it because this is a little bit more different, obviously. This is referring to the believer. And the believer is a little bit different from those Jews back in the promised land in the days of Moses. Because for those Jews, it's just entering the promised land. But for the believer during the book of Hebrews, it's like generally God's household, generally God's place, which is the nation of Israel, or it could be up in heaven itself. So that's the reason why I separated them. That way we can follow along what's going on here. So the gospel of armed warfare, you're going to find out it matches a lot with rest number four, what the Jewish believers, meaning the tribulation saints, what they have to believe, what they have to do to go to heaven. And in this one, you'll see works involved, okay? So let me write that down. So you're going to see faith and works. That's how they enter into the rest. Now, we saw that so far in Hebrews 3 and 4, right? Throughout Hebrews 3 and 4, we've seen all over it's faith and works, faith and works, faith and works. That's the bottom line of the author. Inclusive in this faith and works is the gospel of armed warfare, you have to understand. Why? Because this is works. And this is faith, too. You have to believe very strongly that God's going to defend your case, so you're going to fight for your life here. So that's a lot of work involved out of that faith, okay? All right, now, let's go to Hebrews again, and then uh, we'll go to chapter 4, chapter 4, and then we'll look at verse 3, Hebrews chapter 4. And then we'll look at verse 3. So uh, let me sum it up again, okay? So the author of Hebrews is saying, for we which have believed do enter into rest. So those of us who believe, us Jewish believers, we're entering into God's rest as he said. So this is accordingly to what God stated, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. It's like uh, we, when we believed, the author of Hebrews is saying, and entered into his rest, it was accordingly to what God said in his scripture, that to what he swore in his wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. Meaning, uh, they had to follow the condition to enter into his rest. So not all of them were able to enter into his rest. Now, the reason why I have to uh, stop it right here and then uh, I'll, con I'll explain the last part of verse 3 a little bit later, is I want you to compare with Psalm 95. It seems like that there is a difference here, a different wording here the author is doing. I right, go to Psalm 95. So I have to do this one by one. That way no one gets lost. That way you can understand each and every word what's going on. So I can't just continue on. If you go to Psalm 95, Psalm chapter 95, Verse 11, now remember Hebrews says, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, correct? So if they shall enter into my rest. But if you look at Psalm 95, 11, it goes, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Okay, so this seems like a contradiction right here. Now the simple answer is this. The simple answer is the reason why there's different wordings is because the King James Bible is translating from Hebrew to English, okay? In the New Testament, Hebrews, it's translated from Hebrew to Greek because New Testament is Greek, not Hebrew. But then the King James Bible had to translate that Greek into English. So notice right here that because of going through several different languages, the wordings are different. That's the reason why. But it doesn't mean that the meanings differ here. The reason why is because if you look at what the author is stating right here at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3, he's pointing out if they shall enter into my rest, meaning that because you have to follow a condition, there's going to be those of you who aren't going to be able to enter into the rest. And then in Psalm 95, it's the same idea in verse 11. 
because they did not follow the condition, they weren't able to enter into his rest. See that? So it's the same idea here. It's not a contrary idea. The author is not trying to contradict or give an opposite idea. He's following the same idea, but you can tell that the wording is slightly different because of what? How it carries on from a language to another language to another language to another language. So you have to understand that. Okay. Now that we've established that, when we go back to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3, the author is pointing out right here, the last part of verse 3, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Meaning that there are people who have to follow the condition to enter into his rest. If, if they don't, then they're going to fall out of his rest. And there are people who don't follow the condition into his rest in spite of Christ's finished work, which was foreknown from the beginning of time. That's what, the, that's what it means right here. So if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, is referring to that explanation that I've given to you. That there are people who rejected Christ's finished work, which was foretold or foreordained from the foundation of the world, from the beginning of time. And there are people who rejected that, and that's why they weren't able to enter into his rest. Hopefully they will follow the condition to enter in his rest, recognizing Christ's finished work. Now, how do we know that that's what, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, is referring to? Christ's finished work foreordained before the beginning of time. So, let's look at several scriptures. First of all, we're going to look at John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Let's look at the works were finished. The works were finished. That's referring to Christ's finished work. Look at John chapter 5. Notice what Jesus Christ stated that he was, uh, that his works were uh, ever since the beginning of his ministry to the end of his life, he intends to finish it. So that's from the beginning of his ministry to Calvary. So verse 36, 36. But I have greater witness than that of John. This is Jesus speaking. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. So this is Christ's finished work, referring to the beginning of his life to Calvary. Now, uh, let's see if that's supported from the foundation of the world, Christ's finished work. Go to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter Chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world is truly referring to Christ's finished work that was foreordained before the foundation of the world, before the creation of time. 1 Peter chapter 1, before the creation of the world it was foreordained. 1 Peter chapter 1. Notice what the Bible says in verse 19, verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Right? That's his finished work. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. So it's pretty plain. It's referring to Jesus Christ's finished work ever since from the foundation of the world. Right. Not meaning that Jesus Christ, you know, was working ever since before the foundation but that it was foreordained, yeah. see? So his ministry, his work, his act of redemption, it was foreordained before the foundation of the world. It was planned out. All right, let's go. To Hebrews 4 again. It was, let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. So it was known, it was uh, planned out ever since the beginning. Let's look at verse 4, Hebrews 4.4. 4. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. So the author of Hebrews is pointing out another certain place in the scriptures that God spoke about the rest. His point is rest is significant to God. That's his whole bottom line in the point of Hebrews chapter 4, that there, that 
there is a rest, and a rest is a big deal to God. He would make this place exist. So he uses the book of Genesis chapter 2 about the Sabbath day as his evidence that God did rest the seventh day from all his works. So all of his works, you know, his creation, his acts of creation, he stopped. He rested on that seventh day. Supporting uh, verse 3 that the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So he's trying to point out that there's an end to the work when you go into God's rest. Now, I'll sum all that up later when we come to the end of the verse, all right? So hopefully you're following along. See, this is getting deep, all right? But hopefully you're following along with the flow of the author, what he's trying to drive at. But before we now come to summing up his entire statement, we need to examine verse 4, his argument. So we're getting deep. So how is that his argument? Go to Genesis 2. Genesis chapter 2. Rest number two through three. I kind of put them together because they're tied together. But uh, if we want to make it simpler, number two is referring to the Sabbath day. Number three is referring to the land of Israel being at, literally at rest itself. Amen. At rest itself during the millennium. But why is it tied to rest number two? I'll show you, which is very interesting. Go to Genesis chapter 2. We'll look at verse uh, 2. Genesis 2, 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, supporting the author of Hebrews' argument, right? The work ended. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. So God rested on the seventh day. But look at verse 3. It shows that the Sabbath is a, the seventh day. God sees a particular reason and some importance for it. Verse 3, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his works which God created and made. Okay, so that means the Sabbath, the seventh day, rest is important to God. There's something significant. There's no doubt about that, right? All right, so that's what verse 3 is pointing out. Why is it significant? Because what you're going... Notice right here, God sanctified it for a reason. That's the bottom line, right? right. Yeah. All right, so God sanctified the Sabbath, the seventh day, for a reason. All right, if it's important to God, he might use this for something else, right? Yeah. Right here, the land of Israel itself, the nation of Israel, it rests at the Sabbath. Go to Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26. God wanted those Jews to observe the Sabbath because it's not just for them, it's for his land, the nation of Israel. It rests on the Sabbath. That's what God per perceives it to be. Look at Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus chapter 26. Notice what God says at verse 33. Us. Uh, 33, and I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. So God is proclaiming a curse at those Jews. They will be scattered outside of the land. Verse 34, then shall the land, what? Enjoy her Sabbath as long as it lieth desolate and ye be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbath. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest. Because it did not rest in your Sabbath when he dwelled upon it. See that? So God is pointing out that those Jews were supposed to observe the Sabbath so that the land of Israel can rest. But because they violated it, God wanted to kick them out so that the land of Israel could rest itself and have its own Sabbath. Now think about it. Will the millennium, see that? During the 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ, when God rules over the nation of Israel, Will those Jews observe the Sabbath again? And then the land of Israel will be at rest? Yes. Isaiah 66. Go to Isaiah 66. Isaiah chapter 66. Notice right here that in the, sometime in the future when God restores the nation of Israel, when he comes back and rules over the nation of Israel, that they will be observing the Sabbath. Amen. Notice right here, verse 21, 
Isaiah 66, 21. And I will also take of them for priests and for Levites, saith the Lord. So notice right here the restoration of his people, the nation. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I, sh uh, which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. Okay, the restoration of the nation of Israel. No doubt by context. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from what? One Sabbath, one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. See, he's going to make them observe the Sabbath when he restores the nation of Israel. So the land of Israel will be observing Sabbath. So will the land of Israel be resting then? Yes, Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. It's not just the land of Israel, the whole earth actually, believe it or not. All the land itself. Go to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. Notice in verse 5, Isaiah, well actually let's start with verse 1 by context, Isaiah 14, 1. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. See that? He's restoring the nation of Israel. He's putting them back in their land. Notice verse 5. Verse 5. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. Okay, God conquered all the world. So there's no doubt this is referring to the millennium. All right? He restores the nation of Israel. He conquers all the enemy. It's the millennium. So what does he say right here at verse 7? The whole earth is at what? Rest. rest. How about that? So that is the millennium rest. That's why this is rest number three. So when we go back to Hebrews 4 and verse 4, we can see right here that this is referring to the Sabbath day of rest, but also the land of Israel resting, the millennium. How do we know that? Because we talked about earlier that the rest is referring to what? Right? Israel, the place, right? So then the millennium is obviously on his mind as well. But to make things simpler, we divided it into four so people can follow along better. So notice right here, let's review again. Rest number one is the promised land. Those Jews fell short of his rest and their car carcasses fell in the wilderness. So they failed to enter into his rest. That's referring to the promised land during the Old Testament. Rest number two. The author talks about in Hebrews 4.4, 4, God resting on the seventh day, Sabbath. All right. So that's rest number two. Rest number three is the millennial rest. The millennial rest. And we compare that with the context of Hebrews 3 and 4 with Hebrews for, for itself, connected to the Sabbath. And then rest number four, it's pretty obvious. We're going to keep reading down. This is referring to what the whole point of the author, the believers, uh, the believer in Christ's house. That's rest number four, the believer in Christ's house. That's rest number four. All right, these are four rests you want to keep in mind. All right, if you don't have these in mind, you're going you're gonna to mess up the book of Hebrews. How many people told you that this is salvation by grace through faith and that this is referring to your rest in salvation in Jesus Christ? No stinking way, man. After all these verses, no stinking way. How are you going to connect that to the Sabbath day, by the way? Yeah, come on. I don't know. How are you going to connect that one, you know? So, see, this is, uh, this is very, very confusing. Yeah. How are you going to connect that to the nation of Israel being restored? What about the passages that talk about the millennium, Israel at rest? Are there any verses to support that? If you chop that off of Hebrews, there's none. Come on. So there demands to be a rest in the millennium. You might as well accept it in this passage. Yeah. Amen. All right. Now that we've understood that, Hebrews 4, 5. And in this place again. So he's quoting from the same scripture he quoted before. So he's going to quote it again. If they shall enter into my rest. Boy, that's a big deal to the author. Yeah. He said that so many times already. Like, you better follow the condition or you're not going to enter into his rest. That's the whole bottom line he's saying, all right? Um, I forgot to point out right here, but the works finished from the foundation of the world. The definition is right over here. Christ finished work 
foreknown from the foundation of the world. So I'm sorry, all right? But don't forget that definition we looked at earlier here, okay? Now, he's quoting from Psalm 95 again at Hebrews 4, 5. Let's go to verse 6. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. So the author is pointing out right here, so we see that a rest remains for some people to go inside due to verse 5. Because God's saying there are some people who didn't enter into his rest because they didn't follow the condition. Meaning that that is still available. That's what the author is trying to argue here. That rest is still available. The next part of verse 6, the author is trying to point out those who uh, first heard that preached to them, which is referring to those Jews in the wilderness, they didn't enter inside that rest because of their unbelief, lack of faith. Verse 7, again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David. All right, so the author is quoting again the same scripture. Yeah. This is a big deal to this author. Now, you and I will go, why, why is it a big deal? Why, why? We get it, we get it, we get it. No, 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 because think about this. The Hebrews, remember, they were so hard-hearted. They kept rejecting the apostles' preaching. The apostles, remember, they were anticipating about Jesus Christ coming and the tribulation during that transitional time in the book of Acts. If Paul was writing the book of Hebrews during that time, before he was clearly giving out the Christian revelation, He's trying to persuade these Jews because they were so stubborn, they kept rejecting it. So he keeps insisting right here that, hey, you better believe it. Hey, you better believe it. You're going to fall short of his rest. Hey, God's going to take away the nation of Israel from you. And they did, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. At the first centuries, Jerusalem fell through to the destruction from Rome. Oh, wow. So then notice right here that the author kept warning them, warning them. And then God did give them up. Now they have to wait for two, almost 2,000 years. How about that? Almost 2,000 years till they can finally get their king to come again. So that's why the author keeps insisting, you better follow the condition. You better follow the condition. It's still available while you have the chance. While you have the chance. That's why he says right here, he limited a certain day. He's pointing out, this is a limited time only. You better grab it now. Yeah. And God said this in Psalms. So David, who wrote Psalm. So he's quoting Psalm 95 again. If you go back there, Psalm 95, you'll notice the verse again. Today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Now you can tell the author's really pushing here. He's saying, he's saying at verse seven, again, God is making this a very limited day. He said in David, it's today. And after such a long time, you're putting it off. It's only today. The scripture says, again, at verse 7, the middle of that verse, today, right? It's a limited time. You better grab it now. If you will hear his voice, open your ears. Don't be stubborn. Right. All right. So that's what he's trying to point out. So that definition, terms you need to know today means now limited time. There's no doubt about it. That's what the whole point of the author was about today. You can see that. So we have to understand the mindset of the author, what he's trying to drive at, why he's doing that. All right, verse 8. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not af afterward have spoken of another day? So... The author is pointing out if Jesus give... Uh, gave those uh, gave those people rest. Then he uh, after he gave them rest. He's not going to talk about some other day. So the author is really trying to drive hard today, today, not another day, not another time. Don't think there's another chance. God's not going to talk about that. Verse nine. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, for he that is entered into his rest. He also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. So the author of Hebrews is arguing right here that verse 9, 
the rest is still remaining. It's still available for uh, God's people, the Jews. So you better grab it now while you can. If you once you enter into God's rest, he argues, then you're going to stop from your own works. Just like God stopped his works based on what? At verse four, the Sabbath day. So that's what the author's trying to argue. He's trying to argue to the Jews this is not made up, all right? God did the Sabbath for a reason, to stop his works. That's significant to him. And that rest is mentioned when we see the Old Testament passages that the nation of Israel will truly rest based on the Sabbath. So that Sabbath, that rest is a big deal to God. And that rest, if the land of Israel is going to have that in the millennium, then also keep in mind the Old Testament story that those Jews were kicked out of God's rest in the promised land. Meaning then in totality of all this, he's pointing out in totality of all this, that you better believe yeah. if you want to enter Christ's house. Believe. You better believe in that. All right, don't be stubborn. Don't keep rejecting it. This rest is not made up. We've seen too many Old Testament scriptures that there is a rest and it is a big deal to God, and it connects to his promises to you Jews about the promised land, restoration of Israel, Sabbath day, God blessed, sanctified it, etc. See, that's the whole point of the author. And he's saying right here that those Jews, they can stop doing their own works once they enter into that rest. So think about this. This really looks like, when we look at it at first, salvation by faith, not by works. Hence, Christians, we Christians, can take Hebrews 4, 9 and 10 as uh, application. Notice right here, the believer in Christ's house, like I told you before, we can apply that to the Christian. Remember at the beginning of Hebrews 3? At the beginning of Hebrews 3, Christians are believers in Christ's house. Amen. So we can take Hebrews 4, 9 and 10. It's not by our own works. We enter into his rest, and then there's no works involved. Amen. And we just simply believe the gospel. Amen. So we can take that. But the problem is, so keep this in mind, the problem is this is only a spiritual application, not doctrinal. Right, right. Why? Because you can tell the whole point of the author of Hebrews 3 and 4 in that doctrine was you're going to lose your salvation. And it connects so much to the land of Israel here. It connects so much to Hebrews here, Hebrew doctrine. So we Christians can only, when we look at Hebrews 3 and 4, if there's a certain verse in there that we feel like, you know, that part of the verse, I can spiritually claim it for myself, and that is perfectly fine, and we should. Amen. We should not be hyper-dispensational and say, well, because that's doctrinally to Hebrews, I shouldn't uh, apply that to myself. No, if there's a verse that works with you, you should use it. Amen. I, the greatest example is preaching. That's why hyper-dispensationalists are not good preachers. <laughs> what do preachers do? They don't care what passage of the Bible they'll use. Yeah. If it can work, where people can spiritually get convicted, spiritually learn a lesson, Love spiritually it. get their lives changed, yeah. they'll use any verse if they yeah, have yeah. to. But they're not going to use that as that doctrinally applies to you all the time, right? Like a good example is Mephibosheth, all right? And he said, behold thy servant. Now, obviously, that is not about you, all right? Behold thy servant. But we can get a spiritual lesson out of that. Okay, so that's the idea of Hebrews. So Hebrews 4, 9 and 10, we can take a spiritual lesson out of this spiritual application as a Christian. Because it talks about the believer in Christ's house. So why not heaven, right? Why not being part of the household? There are Pauline verses to support that. So we can take spiritual application. But the doctrinal application we definitely see is for tribulation Jews. You might say, why is that? Because you, what are you going to do with verse 11? All right. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. What in the world? So at verse 10, yeah. it's, it's like you stop doing your works. And then verse 11, you do works. <laughs> you know what this is? You know what this is? So pay attention. This is very important. This is the Calvinist salvation by faith, lordship salvation that they want you to know. 
faith alone, grace alone, not by your own works, but it's a faith that works. It's a grace that works. This is a passage that you can use for that. All right? Is Hebrews 4, 10, and 11. All right? Now, Calvinists, they keep pulling lame verses about faith that works, grace that works. Why don't you use Hebrews 4, 10, and 11? I just helped you out right there. All right? They pull so many verses that don't work. But this is the best verse to prove lordship salvation. That you believe in the gospel and you cease from your works, but you have to labor to enter into that salvation by faith. <laughs> so this is an example of lordship salvation. So what is going on right here? What's the meaning? The meaning of verse 10 through 11 is this, so follow along. The meaning of verse 10 through 11 is that those Jews have to cast off, notice right here, verse 10, their own works, right? Yep, that's right. It's their own works. Now, remember, the Jews' works is outside of the finished work of Christ. Christ's work, Christ's work was finished from, uh, from the foundation of the world. So those Jews have to set aside their own works, put their trust on Christ's finished work. Based on that belief of Christ's finished work, they're supposed to keep it and maintain that belief, that faith in Christ's finished work, which is why there is works involved. Does that make sense now? Right. See that? That's the bottom line. That's the whole bottom line. They put their faith in Christ's finished work, and they have to work hard. They have to labor to stay in there. They, can't, they have to set aside their own works. So remember, they rejected Jesus Christ, their Messiah, the Old Testament, Mosaic law. They've got to reject their Judaism and follow this Hebrew doctrine instead. Yep. This Hebrew doctrine based on Jesus Christ as the Messiah, his finished work. So you've got to work hard to stay in that finished work. That's what the author is pointing out right here. <laughs> so... We point out at Hebrews 4.11, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. So the author is saying, so we've got to work. We've got to labor to enter inside that rest, which is what? The believer in Christ's house. That's the rest. So you've got to work hard, which is referring to the household or it could be for heaven or Israel. So the tribulation Jews have to do that. Why? Otherwise... Anybody is going to fall, fall and follow after the same example of those Jews in the wilderness where they didn't believe. That's what verse 11 is saying. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. All right. We're done. All right. Amen. Great study. Amen, brother. Heavenly Father, I pray that today's teachings were a blessing to the hearers. And I pray that they open our eyes more to the truth of your scripture Help us to continually grow. Help us to keep our eyes open and then uh, keep gleaning great truths from thy book. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.